Attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Bush and Bono, liar, liar, and the last band standing. Plus, this day in history with McVeigh convicted and our song of the day by Arcade Fire on your morning monarchy for June 2nd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another listener supported blast of non commercial alternative media. We've been online since 9 11 05, and just in the last couple of weeks, we've launched our own stream at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Click that link, it'll open your iTunes. Your VLC, which would be probably the preferred player, Windows Media Player, it'll even play in some browsers. Glad you're here. A couple seconds after nine on a Friday. Coming to you live, as always, from the Peak Portland Studios. And it's all brought to you by you, my friends. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. A huge thanks to our latest patron. That's Hans P. He went to Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy and decided to give us a little bit of monthly zeros and ones. And that keeps us going and growing. And we're able to budget on that. The monthly. You, you know how that works. We've also got PayPal, Bitcoin, and the post office box. And I got to go check my post office box today because I believe our friend Megan sent us a package. We'll go check that out. And again, a lot of people don't get into cryptocurrencies. A lot of people don't get into PayPal. You can just send things in the mail. We like it old school like that. If you can give a little, I can give a lot, my friends. Huge thanks also to the Truth Seeker app for carrying the podcast of your morning monarchy. And a huge thanks to RadioConfluence.com for simulcasting. Not only your morning monarchy, your hour of news in the morning, but also your pump up the volume. That's your daily DJ set at noon. Each day of the week on your morning monarchy is a different area of the news. Monday's world news, Tuesday's tech, Wednesday's health, Thursday's weird, and Friday, we call it the entertainment industrial complex. Hashtag media memes. All the stories we're going to talk about in the next hour, we tweeted out about an hour ago, and they are always available about an hour before showtime. Pasted them in the chat. We're trying to rock out the Discord. I've been tweeting out the link to our Discord chat. You're in there with everybody. And also, to, to mixed results, you can also listen to the show through Discord. Boom. Dig it. So we got a lot to go over on your Friday. And again, hope you're doing well whenever, wherever you are. I know you can't always make it live. You might be in a cube, you might be in a car, you might be in a garden. We welcome you with open arms. And glad you're here for a little fear-free look at what's really going on in the news. It's not always good, but we're not ones that are going to tell you that the sky is falling and you can't do anything and you're all screwed. We can do things. The sky isn't falling. We are not all screwed. Oh, no. My Paris Climate Agreement. Trump will withdraw U.S. from Paris Climate Agreement. We may have referenced that a little bit yesterday as, of course, breaking news happens throughout our media monarchy broadcast day. Everybody's panicking. Everybody's freaking out. But our good buddy James Corbett, who is celebrating the decade mark, notes that meanwhile, buried beneath the fold, even mainstream dinosaur media quietly admits U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement changes nothing. Like this quote from Bloomberg. Likewise, despite environmentalist concerns, the American exit is unlikely to have an immediate effect on global efforts to address climate change. And as I pointed out, also with help from our buddy James Corbett of Corbett Report from an article of his a few years ago. Oh no, you mean the multi-trillion dollar carbon trading swindle pioneered by Enron and Goldman Sachs might hang in the balance? Oh my God, what about all that work the Rockefellers and Rothschilds have done for it? They're all into it. Pepsi, General Electric, DuPont, Johnson & Johnson. You know, all those great companies, they're all really excited about the global climate swindle. They want to turn it into a casino. They want to turn it into a stock market. You you don't like economic terms? Oh, you want it in churchy terms? They want you to have carbon indulgences. Such a scam. And again, we always point out, if you want to actually help the environment, you should be anti-war. Always and forever. Putin dismisses scrutiny into Kislyak meeting as hysteria. I'll have a little bit about hysteria towards the end of this episode. Trump administration asked Supreme Court to revive that travel ban. And for the first time in four years, a solo speller claims the national B crown. I used to fancy myself a pretty decent speller. I only took the ACT tests. I did. (laughs) I think I got a 23 on it all. However, and that's because my math and science was terrible. 
My English, pretty damn good. I actually scored in the top two percentile of the spelling and grammar section. That was my one, like, barn burner area. I was like, oh, damn, I'm good at that. You know, Jim would be better at school if he just applied himself. If I would have applied myself, then maybe I could also be taking part in the rat race. U.S. job growth slows. Unemployment rate drops to 4.3% as more phony baloney numbers come out. But they know people are stepping away from the BS casino economy. They're trying to build it themselves, make their own companies, make their own businesses. That's what we love. That's the exciting part about all of this, man. And it's not all news we can chuckle at. Casino staff and guests among the 37 killed at Resorts World Manila as we ask ourselves, why Philippines? Why now? Why ISIS? Doesn't seem to make a hell of a lot of sense. And people like anti-media and other places are asking, why Philippines? And why isn't more mainstream dinosaur media asking why the Philippines? Now, our good friend Swagger Prance seems to have an insane ability to be in the right place at the wrong time. She got into Detroit the night Chris Cornell died. And she also noted she's been at Resorts World Manila in the past. Got to keep our eye out all around, my friends. Not the least of which for when the powers that shouldn't be get together. Lead U2 singer Bono made a pit stop one week ago today at former President George W. Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, a few hours before u two sold-out concert in nearby Richardson. How long have you been waiting for you two? Bono is the real deal, Bush wrote on Instagram. <laughs> even, even that just right there just lets you know. God damn, 2017. Bono is the real deal, Bush wrote on Instagram, along with a photo of himself with Bono at the Prairie Chapel Ranch. He has a huge heart and a selfless soul, not to mention a decent voice. Laura Bush and I are grateful he came to the ranch to talk about the work of the Bush Center, the One Campaign, PEPFAR, and our shared commitment to saving lives in Africa. Both men have been active in efforts to end the AIDS epidemic in Africa. Bush created PEPFAR, the United States President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief while Bono co-founded One, a global campaign and advocacy organization that rallies around AIDS awareness and anti-poverty initiatives. More than 11 million people are alive today thanks to this man's creation of PEPFAR, the U.S. AIDS program that's been saving lives and preventing new HIV infections for over 10 years with strong support from political leaders right, left, and center, Bono wrote on One's Instagram account alongside the photo of the two men. That progress is all at risk now with President Trump's budget cuts, which will mean needless infections and lives lost. Bush wrote an op-ed in the Washington Compost last month, Democracy Dies in Darkness, remember, except when they all sneak away to Bilderberg right now. Bush wrote an op-ed in the Washington Compost last month, urging lawmakers to keep PEPFAR fully funded because approximately 12 million lives have been saved. Nearly 15 years later, the program has achieved remarkable results in the fight against the disease. Is he just trying to balance the murder and mayhem out that he's caused? Is that why all his strange paintings of suckers I sent into the meat grinder who got chopped up for the international war for resources? And what about all the phony baloney advocacy groups, one and the rest? They're basically advertising campaigns, and most of the money you give to those places is used to continue the advertising campaigns. Won't someone please think of the billionaires? We are talking about a lot of billionaires that pose as rockers today on your Morning Monarchy. Again, I'm James Evan Palato from MediaMonarchy.com. Glad you're here. During the first of two Dead and Company shows at the Hollywood Bowl on Wednesday night, John Mayer and his Grateful Dead comrades were interrupted mid-song and ushered off stage as the lights went dark for at least 10 minutes. The L.A. Philharmonic, which manages the bowl, and the Los Angeles County Department of Parks and Rec just confirmed to Billboard that an unfounded bomb threat on stage caused the temporary blackout. Quote, Last night, a performance at the Hollywood Bowl was briefly interrupted while on-site authorities investigated an unfounded bomb threat that was called in during the concert. The Thursday, June 1st statement began. 
because the safety of our patrons is paramount, we immediately initiated a thorough search of the area that turned up no evidence validating the threat. Hollywood Bowl security always includes on-site law enforcement officers, explosive detection dogs. Be, yeah, <laughs> just want to play with the words a little bit. Does that mean the dogs are explosive or does the word explosive modify detection? And they've got metal detectors at all entrances to the venue. The concert resumed without further incident. Resume it did. Billboard attended the show, and though Dead and Co. were interrupted during their performance of He's Gone, they came back out on stage and picked up at the exact same point in the song as if the jam had never stopped. All clear, kind of. Dead legend Bob Weir said to the crowd when they returned, which only fueled rumors throughout the bowl audience and on Twitter of what caused the otherwise unaddressed show stoppage. Before the show even began, the Bowl warned concert goers on Twitter of enhanced security measures at Wednesday night's events, perhaps due in part to last week's suicide bombing at a Manchester, England Ariana Grande concert that left 22 dead and dozens more injured. Indeed, longer than normal lines greeted deadheads outside the Bowl as security ran each fan through metal detectors and bag search. The tweet also suggested, see something, say something. Dead and company returned to the Bowl on Thursday night for their second show, the Grateful Dead last played the Hollywood Bowl in 1974, of course, then led by late frontman Jerry Garcia instead of John Mayer. Thanks, Billboard, for pointing that out. There's a lot of things to break it out on this. One is my general pet peeve of bands who make a giant fucking deal out of breaking up and then continue to constantly tour and make new stuff. What about all those people who spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to go see the final dead shows ever at Soldier Stadium and all that stuff? Oh, yeah, we've already announced new tours with John Mayer. LCD Sound System, we're breaking up and we're making a concert film at Madison Square Garden. Oh, that's right, we reformed and signed to Columbia Records. Do what you say and say what you're going to do. God, that's, <laughs> that's why I tip my hat to Motley Crue, at least signing a legal contract saying, you are done. You will never play as Motley Crue again. Thank you. I've also, I think, pointed out pretty well, and I'm not one to say, like, I predicted that, because I don't really make predictions. I told you last year the move was coming to concerts. We could see it. I could see it telegraphing. So, unfortunately, we should not be surprised at Bataclan, at Pulse, at Manchester. I said repeatedly last year, all your concerts are belong to the powers that shouldn't be. I was looking at it more of a cash grab kind of thing. I didn't know that they would pretty much usher it into the world of terror. So, as long as we're talking about the Warlocks, original name of the Grateful Dead, and all those members who love to hang out at Bohemian Grove... A guitar that Jerry Garcia played everywhere from San Francisco's Winterland Ballroom to Egypt's Great Pyramids fetched over $1.9 million at an auction in New York. The Grateful Dead frontman's guitar, named Wolf, was purchased at a charity auction in Brooklyn Wednesday night. The proceeds, get this, are earmarked for the Montgomery, Alabama-based Southern Poverty Law Center. The guitar was owned by deadhead devotee Daniel Pritzker. The philanthropist, musician, and film director bought it back in 2002 at Guernsey's for $790,000. Not a bad investment. The auctioneer says that Wolf first appeared in a 1973 New York performance of The Grateful Dead that they were giving for their fantastic friends in The Hell's Angels. The 1977 film, The Grateful Dead Movie, was directed by Garcia and features extensive footage of the instrument Wolf. Garcia, you might recall, died way back in 1995. Unlike many musicians that often swap guitars frequently, Jerry played only a handful of guitars throughout his career. The most famous of all of them is Wolf. Selling once, selling twice, sold to you for $1,600,000. Uh, it's an auction and it's, you know, the auction comes up with the fair price. So it's marked to market at 1.6 million. I don't plan on selling it or trading it. And so it's somewhat priceless. Um, I doubt this will sell anytime soon, if ever. Uh, I'm very happy to have it. I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna share it. I'm gonna take very good care of it. So 
So there you have Jerry Garcia's Wolf guitar from the Warlocks, which played at the Great Pyramids. There's a lot of different numbers associated with it. says it fetches 1.9 million, but if you get that update, and you can actually see in that report, that audio clip that I played for you, the guy who bought it, ultimately, it's raised more than $3 million to support the SPLC. There was some kind of, if you do this, there'll be a matching amount, and I don't know if you've ever gone to Richie Rich auctioneer kind of thing. So there'll be a guy who'll be like, I'll match anyone's bet up to $4,000. That sort of thing. Three million dollars for the fine folks at the Southern Poverty Law Center. You're listening to Your Morning Monarchy for Friday, June 2nd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. And on Fridays, we look at the entertainment industrial complex. And it seems like there's not been a week that we have not had to do a bunch of obituaries. Tragic news to report as Paul O'Neill, the founder and leader of Trans-Siberian Orchestra, passed away at the age of 61 on April 5th from an undisclosed chronic illness. Over the past 20 years, Trans-Siberian Orchestra has been one of the world's most successful touring acts, often performing Christmas music that is powered by progressive metal and hard rock instrumentation. It's been reported that the band has sold more than 10 million tickets, along with more than 10 million albums. Prior to creating Trans-Siberian Orchestra, O'Neill was a major force in management and promotion, working with such acts as Aerosmith, ACDC, Scorpions, Madonna, and others. Our thoughts and best wishes go out to O'Neill's family, friends, and bandmates during this difficult time. So that was actually the original report when Paul O'Neill died at age 61, just a couple of months ago, back, at, back in April. We now have the update on that, and I don't believe I reported that when it originally happened, or at least I don't recall. But again, everything we say and play included in the show notes. You can see all those links. You can see the guy that bought Wolf, all that good stuff. We can now report for you that a month after Trans-Siberian Orchestra leader Paul O'Neill died at the age of 61 from what was described as chronic illness, as you even heard in that report, the Associated Press is now reporting that the mastermind behind the perennial holiday favorite touring extravaganza was felled by a deadly mix of prescription drugs. According to a copy of the autopsy report from the Hillsborough County Medical Examiner's Office in Tampa, Florida, O'Neill died of intoxication from a mixture of methadone, codeine, Valium, and an antihistamine. Doctors pegged the cause of death as intoxication and the manner of death as drug abuse, noting that O'Neill also suffered from heart disease, hypertension, and moderate hardening of the arteries. Medical examiner said the death was accidental. O'Neill was found dead in his room as was the style at the time, the Tampa Embassy Suites Hotel by staff. An official statement from O'Neill's family reported that the multi-instrumentalist died as a result of an unexpected reaction to prescription medication for his various ailments. Quote, the Hillsborough, Florida Medical Examiner's Office has determined the official cause of death of Paul O'Neill's death, rather, as accidental, resulting from an unexpected reaction to prescribed medications to treat his numerous chronic illnesses, including bone augmentation surgery, complications from spinal fusion surgery, and the aforementioned heart disease and hypertension. That was what the statement read this past Tuesday, May 30th. Paul O'Neill. Another death. Another body sacrificed at the foot of Big Pharma. Here, take this drug. It'll help counteract the side effects from these other eight drugs we've got you on. Hypertension, heart disease, all of that, if I'm not mistaken, is fairly avoidable also with a little bit of good diet and exercise. The other massive obituary to cover for you this week is really interesting because our buddy Courage Sower asked me to play some Almond Brothers. We actually played Almond Brothers just a couple of weeks ago on your daily DJ set at noon, and now... Greg Allman, Southern Rock pioneer, Allman Brothers band leader, passed away peacefully at his home in Savannah, Georgia at the age of 69. Some sad news from the world of music, the sudden death of a rock icon. Greg Allman passing away today at the age of 69. Here's ABC's Ron Claiborne with a look back at his life and his music. <laughs> Greg Allman and older brother Duane were the driving force behind one of the greatest southern rock and roll bands ever, combining rock, blues, and jazz in a distinctive, hard-driving, high-energy sound. Inseparable as children growing up in Tennessee, Duane was the charismatic lead guitarist of the original band, formed in 1969. Greg played keyboards and was the group's gravelly-voiced, soulful lead singer. 
as he talked about in the documentary Southern Rock. It started playing, and I mean, it just knocked me out. And I just snatched some lyrics, and I did my best to sing it my best. The band would turn out hit after hit, including Midnight Rider. Midnight Rider. After Dwayne died in a motorcycle crash in 1971, Greg kept the band together. In 1975, Greg Allman married Cher. It was a turbulent union as Greg descended into heavier and heavier drug and alcohol use, as he told Dan Rather. I went to 14 rehabs. 14 rehabs. But I didn't go to 15. <laughs> the couple divorced in 1978. Through ups and downs, Greg Allman kept going, performing and churning out solo and Allman Brothers albums, performing live. But this past March, he suddenly stopped touring because of health issues. Tonight, the tributes pouring in. Ringo Starr tweeting, Rest in peace, Greg Allman. Peace and love to all the family. And Brad Paisley, what a legacy Greg Allman leaves behind. Jam on in the great hereafter. Greg Allman died at his home in Savannah, Georgia today. He was 69 years old. Now, one amusing thing about that, I'm sure there were a lot of tweets to choose from of celebrities and fellow musicians sending their love out to Greg Allman. It's funny that they chose the Ringo Starr one because even when they put it on screen, they have to go, sick. He misspelled Greg. You know, you put S-I-C in the little parentheses. Spelling is correct. It's incorrect. Another death, thanks to the pill machines. It's too soon to properly process this. Allman Brothers band guitarist Dickie Betts said in a statement, I'm so glad I was able to have a couple of good talks with him before he passed. In fact, I was about to call him to check and see how he was when I got the call. It's a very sad day. Allman's longtime manager and close friend Michael Lehman added, I've lost a dear friend and the world lost a brilliant pioneer in music. Although Allman claimed the term was redundant, the singer-keyboardist helped create the first great Southern rock group as a co-founder of the legendary Allman Brothers Band alongside his older brother, famed guitarist Dwayne Allman. The Allmans fused country blues with San Francisco-style extended improvisation, with their sound creating a template for countless subsequent jam bands. Quite the sync with Grateful Dead, of course. Greg Allman was blessed with one of blues rock's great growling voices and along with his Hammond B3 organ playing beholden to Booker T., it all had an emotional power. Writing in Rolling Stones, ZZ Top Billy Gibbons said that Allman's singing and keyboard playing displayed a dark richness, a soulfulness that added one more color to the Almond's rainbow. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy as we are looking at the entertainment industrial complex and what do we see weaving their way through just story after story after story. It's Big Pharma. It's the big poison companies that also coincidentally own a lot of the uh, big food companies. Jim Carrey is expected to face trial over the suicide of his former girlfriend, Katharina White, Irish-born makeup artist, Katharina White, age 30. 30 years old, found dead in September 2015 after overdosing on prescription drugs. Carrey and White began dating in 2012 after meeting on a film set. Though the couple split in late 2013, it is understood that they reunited earlier in 2015 before parting ways again shortly before White's passing. The Press Association now reports that White's mother, Bridget Sweetman, and estranged husband Mark Burton are both suing the 55-year-old actor Jim Carrey in wrongful death suits, claiming that he provided White with the prescription drugs that she overdosed on. Sweetman also alleged that Carrie gave her daughter sexually transmitted diseases and pressured her into silence shortly before her death. A judge at a Los Angeles Superior Court ruled on Wednesday, May 31st, that the case would go to trial, which is expected to last 20 days. Carrie's lawyer had asked the judge to throw out the case, arguing that his client would find the trial, as most people being brought on trial would find it, very painful. Carey denies the malicious and predatory allegations. Jim Carey is set to face trial over the death of his ex-girlfriend Katrina White. The actor, who had an on and off relationship with the County Tipperary makeup artist, is being sued by her parents as they believe he supplied drugs that led to her death. A post-mortem found the 30-year-old died from an overdose of various prescription drugs, with a coroner recording her death as suicide. 
Despite Jim's lawyer's efforts to dismiss the case, a Los Angeles Superior Court judge indicated that she wouldn't throw out the lawsuit and has estimated that the trial would last at least 20 days. Kerry's lawyer said that Mr. Kerry loved Miss White dearly and obviously it will be a very painful process for him. The Truman Show star hasn't yet commented on the latest developments directly, but when the legal proceedings were initially filed against him, he released a statement saying, I will not tolerate this heartless attempt to exploit me or the woman I loved. Kat's troubles were born long before I met her, and sadly her tragic end was beyond anyone's control. The trial is set to begin on the 26th of April, 2018. Responding to the initial news of White's path- passing, Kerry said last year, I am shocked and deeply saddened by the passing of my sweet Katharina. She was a truly kind and delicate Irish flower, too sensitive for this soil to whom loving and being loved was all that sparkled. My heart goes out to her family and friends and everyone who loved and cared about her. We've all been hit with a lightning bolt. The late Katharina White posted a final post to Twitter before her death. It read, Signing off Twitter, I hope I have been a light to my nearest and dearest. Pretty gross. Jim Carrey, obviously one that... (laughs) ...likes to have his feet in a few different plants, so to speak. May act like he's one thing. Generally seems to be a tool of the estate. Not the estate, the state. And that's a good question over in the chat. Truman Show was out a long, long, long time ago. Is that going to be the one he'll be remembered for? Is that what they refer to him now? I think it's an interesting and perhaps fitting one. It's the most syncastic film that people like to point out. That it's all a giant fake movie show. It's all being run by Ed Harris. And now that we've... Stepped our foot into the disgusting world of film. Lebanon. Seeking to ban the new Wonder Woman movie because its lead actress, Gal Gadot, is an Israeli. A reflection of how the decades-old animosity between the two neighbors is infused in the cultural scene. A security official said a formal request for a ban has not yet been received. A ban would require a recommendation from a six-member committee from the Ministry of Economy, a process that hadn't begun yet as the writing of this Associated Press report. A premiere of Wonder Woman was scheduled for Wednesday in at least one cinema in Beirut. Posters of the movie and digital billboards have sprouted up all around the Lebanese cap- capital, but I can tell you officially now, they did it. Roughly two hours before the film was scheduled to screen in the country's movie theaters Wednesday, Lebanon officially banned the Wonder Woman movie. The ban is reportedly due to the fact that the film's lead actress, Gal Gadot, is Israeli. Lebanon, which has been at war with Israel for decades, currently has a law that encourages boycotts of Israeli products and bars Lebanese citizens from traveling to Israel. The group who led the boycott of the movie added that Gadot, who once trained as a soldier in the Israeli army, has also praised Israel's military actions during the 2014 war in Gaza. True words in the chat. All these comic movies are lame. On her Facebook page, Godot had praised Israel's military during the 2014 Gaza-Israel war, sending prayers to soldiers, quote, who are risking their lives, protecting my country against the horrific acts conducted by Hamas, end quote. Officials at Lebanon's econo- economy ministry did not return calls seeking comment. The security official said banning a movie would ultimately come from the country's interior minister following that recommendation from the six-member committee. Warner Brothers, which has released the film, declined comment. By the power of ISIS is what Wonder Woman used to be in the 70s. Of course, that's the Wonder Woman that I know. I've maybe made references here and there that as a young kid, I was really into Linda Carter and the Wonder Woman. It's just not exactly sure why I liked it so much. That that was pretty much must-see TV for me. Also pointed out in the chat before we move on, Ed Harris essentially plays the same role in Snowpiercer. He is the official worldview ender. That is the role he plays in films. I'm playing the role of host Webmaster DJ from MediaMonarchy.com. I'm James Evan Pilato. Glad you joined us. We are live Monday through Friday, essentially 9 to 5, right at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Your morning monarchy, 9 a.m. Pacific time, and your pump up the volume daily DJ set at noon. I've got brand spanking new music that's pretty damn good from Arcade Fire coming up at the end of this episode. 
and your Pump Up the Volume coming up in a couple of hours is going to be nearly an all-new Music Friday episode. So tell a friend about MediaMonarchy.com. The hits just keep on coming. A song accusing Theresa May of being a liar has reached the top 10 of the iTunes download chart, performed and produced by the band Captain Ska, or in some places referred to as Captain S-K-A. Pretty sure it's Ska. Promoted the campaign organization The People's Assembly Against Austerity. The song titled Liar Liar features speeches and news interviews from Theresa May, followed by a chorus of She's a Liar Liar, You Can't Trust Her, No, 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 No. The song talks about the NHS, education, and levels of poverty. It is at number nine in the iTunes chart, having overtaken Miley Cyrus, Niall Horan, and Ed Sheeran. Liar, liar. A song labeling Prime Minister Theresa May as a liar has shot to the top of the music sales charts in Britain, mocking her strong and able motto ahead of the June 8th national election. Hitting out at the austerity policies of Britain's Conservative Party, the song stitches together samples of May's speeches with choruses of She's a liar, liar, no, you can't trust her. Captain SKA, a London-based band led by producer Jake Painter, is aiming for the number one spot in Britain's official Top 40 chart. So there's your Captain SKA. Theresa May's a liar. Overtaking all the Disney songstresses on the pop charts now what i'll do is actually i'll play that song on your daily dj set at noon i grab that news report but also grab the song liar liar from captain ska and we'll spin that alongside some other new music on your daily dj set at noon coming up at noon pacific time now i've maybe not referenced it on the morning show here but i've definitely mentioned it on pump up the volume. And again, I always say, if you're only listening to one show and not listening to the other, you're kind of missing half of the monarchy kingdom. Two great tastes that taste great together, I like to say. So I've made some references in there, and maybe in general. Of course, when I was working at the commercial radio station, as you might imagine, I had lots of concert tickets coming at me. And the great thing about being more of an indie fan is, of course, I wanted the tickets to things that nobody else wanted. So it was pretty easy to get the stuff that I wanted to go see. Hey, can I get those Morrissey tickets? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Ever since leaving the commercial radio station, I don't have the concert gravy train. So I've got to be a little more careful. And pro tip, if you live in a city, I bet your clubs and your venues and some of the promotion places, they've got weekly emails that they send out. And in those emails, there's always concert tickets. There's always chances to win free stuff. I win concert tickets fairly regularly. All you got to do is enter. All you got to do is reply and go, hey, James, I want to go see this. And you either get it or you don't. So that's one pro tip sidebar. But I've also had to be a little more proactive. So I don't know if you're like me. Love music, love going out, but is also kind of a tightwad. The night of a show or the day of a show or weekend of a show will roll around and you're like, eh, I don't feel like going. So this year I've actually been a little more proactive on buying tickets in advance for shows I know I want to go see that I'll only be disappointed in myself when the show rolls around and I don't go to it. And that, unless, of course, the power goes out in the entire downtown Portland area and your Jesus and Mary Chain concert is canceled and not rescheduled. Did get my money refunded back already, but I would prefer to have seen Jesus and Mary Chain again. So I've been buying lots of concert tickets. So I've got tickets that I'm still sitting on. We're going to go see Belle and Sebastian coming up for my birthday this August. Got tickets for Chick Chick Chick, The Drums. But I also just bought tickets... And I'm not a big stadium show fan. Actually, just saw my brother had posted from last weekend. He went to go see Metallica at Madison Square Garden, which would probably be pretty rad. I'm not a stadium show fan. I have seen approximately three stadium shows in my life, and they've all pretty much been in the last three years. When I was working back at the radio station, I got to go see Nine Inch Nails at the big stadium here, the Trailblazers place, the Moda Center, it's called. I also got to see Elton John on his All the Hits All Night tour, which was pretty much as promised, just a pretty good greatest hit show. And I love seeing the legendary bands. As, as I now get older, it's like, oh shit, Roger Waters is coming through town in just a couple of weeks. He has a brand new 
truth bomberific record that comes out today. More about that in just a couple of minutes. But we also saw Morrissey and Tom Jones at a L.A. stadium. Those are my three big stadium shows, and they're all, again, just from the last couple of years. Because I'd rather... <laughs> I'd rather not spend $29.50 on a ticket that ultimately ends up costing $45 when I could go spend 15 bucks and go hang out with Black Marble like I did a couple of weeks ago, talk to him, be right up at the front, get him to sign the thing, sign the record, buy the record from them, put cash in their hand, talk about Chris Cornell, talk about Vancouver, B.C., clubs and those kind of shows there's just no comparison and that's i think a lot of what media monarchy is that's why i like doing this keeping it on a smaller level it's more fun to hang out with people it's so much more community oriented i often mention our band could be your life just the same as the music industry says isn't some inaccessible thing and they're rock gods that are untouchable same thing with this you guys this band could be your life so to speak so in an effort to be a little proactive and get some concert tickets, I bought a ticket. I only bought one, and I got the hard copy. I mentioned this yesterday on Pump Up the Volume. I got the hard copy because I wanted to actually hold in my hands a ticket that said Def Leppard, Poison, and Tesla, and 2017, all on the same <laughs> ticket. So they're coming to town actually two Saturdays from now. And just as I've been thinking about this, and again, I was biggest of those three into Poison back as a kid. Now, we were not allowed to have music so much as kids. It was kind of the churchy wall that I had to break through. Took a long time. But dads, as cool dads are apt to do, he let me have some stuff that we kept in his car, such as Poison's Fallen Angel single, which kept in my dad's car. It was the only place I ever really got to listen to it. Poison, I was, I was kind of into Tesla a little bit, and of course, Def Leppard's Hysteria is just a landmark. I'd much rather go see Def Leppard's 30th anniversary of Hysteria than U2's 30th anniversary of Joshua Tree. But just as this has been swirling around in my brain, we go to the grocery store the other night, and I always take a glance at the magazines. And we're going to take a glance at magazines in just a minute for a quick magazine time schedule segment. Glance at Rolling Stone. And I forget which pop pimp was actually on the cover. But I see this little 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 banner thing that said, The last hair metal band standing inside Poison's never-ending party. How Brett Michaels and company turned a string of 80s hits into 30-plus years of debauched good times. And it's got a photo of them playing just a couple of weeks ago as they are opening for Def Leppard. And they're coming here to town. So it's a pretty interesting article that basically, you know, all the things you're supposed to hate, all the knee-jerk stuff you're supposed to hate, the way grunge wiped away hair metal. And I've seen people tweeting at me, it's like, I'm really surprised that the hair metal guys are outliving the grunge guys. Well, the grunge guys were all deeply depressed and on hardcore drugs. That might have something to do with it. Meanwhile, Sebastian Bach and all the rest, he's actually told a story recently of the time Soundgarden opened for them. And I don't know, the more time goes by, the more I kind of reject the idea that Nirvana's... Frankie, you really had to knock the plant off the windowsill? Bad cat! Oh, live radio, my friends. It's <laughs> a lot of dirt on the floor. <clears throat> anyway, what I'm saying is... I really reject the idea that Nirvana is the voice of my generation. I decided a long time ago, you know what? I think it's the Beastie Boys, if anything. We grew up with them. Their snotty adolescence, their drug-addled middle years, the more politically, socially, emotionally-minded later years. What did Nirvana do? Cacked out after two records. Compare the lyrics of some of the bands. Well, let's see. Oh, the moving lyrics of Nirvana, like, Dog Steak Test Meat. Or you could tear down the rat racial slime. Can't be king of the world if you're slave to the grind. It's fun to reassess the things you're supposed to take as sacrosanct. So let's take a quick look at magazine time, my friends. I did not buy that issue of Rolling Stone, just so you know. I get most of my magazines through prescriptions. Subscriptions, I guess you call them. I guess you could make that drug reference that they are a little bit like prescriptions. 
And a favorite is Magnet Magazine out of Pennsylvania. A long-running independent music magazine. Yeah, they get their little Trump things in here and there, which have totally lost them subscribers, as I've read. But it's a great indie music magazine, and one of my qualifications for a good music magazine is that all the ads are for records. I don't want to see any fucking video game ads or fashion bullshit. I want music. That's all I want. Magnet Magazine is great for that. Their latest issue has Amy Mann on the cover as she's interviewed by Mad Men creator Matthew Weiner. Magnet has kind of been doing a thing where their cover star is interviewed by someone sort of equally famous. So they got a cool interview with Juana Molina. We've played some of her on Pump Up the Volume. They've also got an interesting conversation with Depeche Mode's Martin Gore as they talk about how the alt-right are sort of aligning themselves with Depeche Mode or trying to imply that Depeche Mode are aligned with them. We played their newest single, Where's the Revolution? From the new Depeche Mode record, Spirit, essentially saying, Hey, you guys, why aren't you up in arms? Why aren't you starting a revolution? You're letting me down. Interesting interview with Martin Gore. Another of my favorite, favorite magazines I can't recommend enough is called Tape Op. It comes from right here in Oregon. It's run by Larry Crane, who's run Jackpot Recording. He's produced a lot of records, not the least of which Elliot Smith, which we mentioned on last month's Magazine Time, the previous issue of Tape Op, talked about how a lot of Elliot Smith's Either Or was recorded, good God, so close to where I live right now. It's such a strange feeling for a record that I listened to on cassette tape 20 years ago. I now essentially jog past the recording locations. Tape Op, you can subscribe to for free. They basically send it out media mail, so you get the physical issues a little bit late, but it's fucking free. It's ridiculous. They even give you a fancy, fancy PDF version as well. So the latest issue of Tape Op, among other things, like interviews with Thomas Dolby, and it's got all kinds of gear reviews and things that a lot of it goes over my head. But they have an interesting interview with Juana Molina as well, and they talk to Rod Argent. Everybody's all Sergeant Pepper, rah, 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 but everybody's forgetting Odyssey and Oracle. Rod Argent from the Zombies. They've got a great 50-year Odyssey interview done by Larry Crane. And they've actually recently, Tape Op has launched a podcast as well. They're not putting out tons of episodes, but what they're putting out is interview with Brian Eno, interview with Glenn Johns, interview with Steve Al... Did they do a Steve Albini? Interview with Jack White. They're fantastic, not super overproduced. It's basically, you can tell, it's just a conversation between Larry Crane and the guest. I also, last year subscribed to NME, New Musical Express out of the UK, which maybe like a lot of things becomes just a shitty acronym because it's not just music. This is the perfect example of what I was griping about a couple of moments ago. I think the latest issues of NME are all branded with Wonder Woman. And as you flip through NME, it's really difficult if you don't have a little bit of media literacy to tell the difference between paid advertising content and the actual content of the magazine. You sometimes have to look up in the corner and go, oh, that's right, that's why you're talking about this, is because it's an ad. The two interesting things I want to point out of this latest physical issue of Enemy that I have, and again, subscribing to magazines from the UK is a little bit expensive, and I now regret is a little bit strong, but I will not in any way, shape, or form be renewing my NME subscription. I would like to flip that over and get something much better like Mojo Magazine, which, as referred to earlier, is nothing but music ads and music content. In praise of Lisa Simpson, feminist icon is in this latest issue of NME, which they're crapping their pants about the general election 2017. They've also got an interesting piece about a new book written by Virginia Hanlon Grohl. That's right, Dave's mom. She wrote a book, From Cradle to Stage, Talking with Famous Rock Stars Moms. It's a little bit precious, but it's kind of cute to see moms talk about Michael Stipe or Dr. Dre or Amy Winehouse or Mike D of the Beastie Boys. That's your NME. And finally, I love to look at Record Collector News. That's another one that I've subscribed to, but if you hit up record stores, you can usually see it in the racks there in the out. They've got a fantastic, large article about Francis Albert Sinatra and Antonio Carlos Jobim, that expanded 50th anniversary edition of their landmark EP together, and a pretty big interview with legendary British blues rock guitarist Robin Trower. 
time, and emotion. That's a quick look at magazine time, my friends. That's my favorite form of disposable media, as we love all forms of media here in the monarchy. It is a new Music Friday, taking a glance at some of the new records coming out today. That big, massive, overstuffed Joshua Tree 30th Anniversary Edition is actually released today, and I think it's interesting. We talked about this with Thomas Sheridan several months ago. Once Trump happened, once Brexit happened, a lot of the political lip flappers, they all shut up about politics. Bono might be a lot of things. Stupid he is not. They realized, oh man, you guys, we got to probably get off the political train. Ooh, let's just do Joshua Tree 30th anniversary. Good idea. So that record comes out today as well. Brand new record from Roger Waters. Is this really the life that we want? Coming out today, our buddy Keith in the chat notes that it's it's pretty awesome. Dropping lots of truth bombs, not unlike that latest Jeff Beck record, Loud Hailer. God, <laughs> what does it say that still better protest music is coming out of Roger Waters? Can't we have our own new protest music, as was once said in the film Jarhead? That new Alt-J record comes out today, new Amber Arcades, new Death in Vanilla, and one that we've played for you a couple of times on Pump Up the Volume is a little band called Beach Fossils. God, their song this year from their brand new record, Somersault, which comes out today, is just a killer. You know, sometimes you listen to those songs and there's certain ways the melodies flow. Whew, rough. It almost it like brings this instant feeling of like 70s ennui or something. We'll play this year from the Beach Fossils again. Just like we'll keep playing all the music and all the news and all those stories you just heard all collected on your Twitter moment that I call it. Basically, Twitter lets you put together a bunch of stories, and that's how I put together the stories of each episode. Tweet them out about an hour before showtime, so if you are in the chat, I'll post them in there, and of course, they are on the tweets, and you can follow along with the stories that we're telling as we're doing it live. We're going to go out with pretty impressive new music from a little band called Arcade Fire. More about their just-announced fifth album and the title track coming up in just a few minutes. Of course, after this day in history, my friends, past his prologue, June 2nd, 1835, P.T. Barnum and his circus start their first tour of the United States. 1896, Marconi applies for a patent for his wireless telegraph. And as Milhouse noted, the first message he would ever send is, I want to change my name. June 2nd, 1919, quote-unquote, Anarchists simultaneously set off bombs in eight separate U.S. cities. June 2nd, 1924, U.S. President Calvin Coolidge signs the Indian Citizenship Act into law, granting citizenship to all Native Americans born within the territorial limits of the United States. June 2nd, 1953, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth Beast II, who is crowned Queen of the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and her other realms and territories and head of the Commonwealth. That's a hell of a title. That was also the first major international event to be televised on this day in 1953. On this day, during the 1962 FIFA World Cup, police had to intervene multiple times in fights between Chilean and Italian players in one of the most violent games in football history. They, they are probably mad that their games always end in ties. June 2nd, 1967, Luis Mong is executed in Colorado's gas chamber in the last pre-Furman execution in the United States, Furman being the case by the Supreme Court that overturned death penalties in America. But of course, they're coming back, as we reported for you yesterday in Alabama. They're coming back with a vengeance, and they're rushing to do it because their drugs are expiring. Got to use them. June 2nd, 1967, that same day. Protests in West Berlin against the arrival of the Shah of Iran turn, of course, into riots, during which Benno Onsorg is killed by a police officer. His death results in the founding of the terrorist group Movement 2nd June. The third event on 1967 going along with all of that. Isn't it interesting? We hear a lot of stories and then you look it up and go, oh, wait, Sergeant Pepper didn't come out yesterday. Not in America, it didn't. This is the day Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band released by the Beatles in America. It was released in the UK and everywhere else in the world on June 1st, the day before. June 2nd. 1997, 
Timothy McVeigh, former U.S. Army soldier, is convicted on 15 counts of murder and conspiracy for his role in the 1995 terrorist bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. John, do you feel it? Well, I think we're all uh, anxious to hear what the jury will say and to tell us what their view of the evidence they heard is. Are you optimistic? Well, I'm uh, neither optimistic nor pessimistic. If I could predict what a jury would do, as I've said before, I wouldn't be practicing law. We have visited with Mr. McVeigh. We will be working with him tonight and tomorrow for the preparation of the second stage on Wednesday. Beyond that, I cannot say more. Thank you. I cannot answer any more. Thank you. We thank the victims for their patience dignity throughout this long ordeal. We're obviously very pleased with the result. We always had confidence in our evidence. Now everyone else will have confidence in the evidence in the verdict. We're ready to move on to the next day. Thank you. There you have it. This day in history, 1997, Timothy McVeigh convicted. One quick throwback from the chat about Sgt. Pepper's. You know, not every album cover has Aleister Crowley on it. He's usually just in the lyrics. So we better promote the fuck out of the only one that does have Aleister Crowley on the cover. (laughs) Posted to Media Monarchy. Oh, wait, one more. One more. 2012 on this day, June 2nd, former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak sentenced to life in prison for his role in the killing of demonstrators during the 2011 so-called Egyptian Revolution. Another color revolution stirred up by the powers that shouldn't be. Holy crap, you know, I was just thinking, you guys... Rockefeller's dead. Big New Brzezinski's dead. But so much is happening, we haven't had a lot of time to even reflect on that. And Hosni's now a free man. Published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today, another phony terror bust. Authorities arrested three suspects in pursuit of a fourth in connection to a plot to blow up a fuel line running through New York City's JFK International Airport. And another one that was basically more aspirational than operational. But that doesn't stop the terror procedures from ratcheting up. New York City searches sewer line for 9-11 remains. The city finished searching a service road and a skyscraper hovering over the World Trade Center site for remains of 9-11 victims. And now they turn their search to sewer lines because that's how much they love you. A documentary called Severe Visibility was posted to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. And as this classic article, closing up the four articles I posted to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, famed U.S. military mad scientist Bureau DARPA engaged in an effort to grow and build cyborg moths for use as spies. DARPA to create brain-chipped cyborg moths posted a decade ago today to MediaMonarchy.com. We let you know the news before it's the reality. Celebrating birthdays today on June 2nd, English novelist and poet Thomas Hardy, born on this day in 1840, and the legendary Tarzan Johnny Weissmuller, born on this day in 1904. It's also Hot Lips Kellerman's birthday, Sally Kellerman, born on this day. She's Hot Lips from MASH, right? And a day after his Rolling Stones bandmate... Charlie Watts celebrating a birthday today. It's also the late, great Marvin Hamlish's birthday. Film director Lassie Hallstrom and the Beeve, Jerry Mathers. He and Cornell West share a birthday today. It's also Dennis Haysbert's birthday. Dana Carvey. Wrestling's Lex Luger. That's more from my era. Street artist Lydia Lunch. Black Flag Misfits member Des Kadena. Be Real from Cypress Hill and Prophets of Rage. Wayne Brady. Tim Rice Oxley from Keen. And Justin Long. Yeah, Scroat, you might remember him as Dr. Lexus in Idiocracy. And there you have it, my friends. There's your morning monarchy. And we are going out with brand spanking new music from Arcade Fire. Just yesterday, they announced their new fifth album and shared the title track and new video. It's called Everything Now. It's coming out on July 28th. And it was produced by members of Daft Punk and Pulp. Pretty sweet. We're going out with Everything Now from Arcade Fire as we wrap up another week of your morning monarchies. I appreciate you being here, my friends, and hope you'll tell a friend about the stream. As we're streaming 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Please tell a friend about our independent, non-commercial alternative media. That keeps us going and growing. There you have it. Your Friday Media Memes edition of your Morning Monarchy for June 2nd, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you so very much for listening. Bottom of my heart.
and reminding you, as always, like Jella Biafra said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.